You're listening to Leading Up with Udemy. This podcast is your guide to developing your skills as an emerging or seasoned leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently to create a better world. I was super excited to have Jack Daly on the podcast this week. Most of us set a goal like run a marathon, write a book, or earn more money. But the level of specificity that Jack brings to goal setting is a thing of beauty. He maps out the year and then works backwards to the quarter, the month, and the week. Just totally impressive. Things that get measured get done. How are you spending your time and what are you spending your time on? This week, we're talking with legendary speaker, author, and CEO coach, Jack Daly. He's got a four-decade track record of leadership excellence, having built and grown six companies into large national firms. He's the best-selling author of several books, including The Sales Playbook, Hyper Sales Growth, and most recently, Life by Design. Jack's energy is boundless. He's completed Ironman triathlons on all continents and done marathons in all 50 states. He's been called the best professional sales coach in America, and leadership author Simon Sinek says, Jack Daly stands above all others. He's living an extraordinary life and plans to keep doing so until he's 125. He's agreed to share some secrets with us today. Jack, welcome to the podcast. Alan, it is a blast. And when you start introducing me like that, I'm sitting here going, oh my God, I actually did that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's where I want to start. So I think we have to hear about your incredible journey because most of us go through life in a meandering way. We make progress in fits and starts. How did you discover the idea that you could craft a life by design rather than by default? Yeah. Um, So I'm very blessed. I grew up in a blue collar family. And at 13 years old, I took a caddying job at the private country club in our town. And what I really discovered in the first week was people were playing golf on Wednesdays and same person on Friday and on the weekend, and they were arriving in nice cars, and they lived in big estate homes, and that was nothing like the house and family that I lived in. And I said, well, if I had a choice in life, which one would I choose? And I decided the answers were with those people at the club. And I designed questions to ask them as I carried the clubs. And what I really learned, because I heard it repetitively from different members, you have to have goals. They need to be in writing. Don't pick too many. Share them with other people and put some indicator like a finish date in order for you to get there. So I picked four goals where I wanted to be when I got old at 30. And they were (laughs) financially, professional education and family. And if I could figure out what my end zone was going to be to make a successful life, then I just needed to work backwards into 29 to 30, 28 to 29, 13 to 14. And because of that, I'm now here in front of you at 74 years old, and I have 60 years of annual plans that those annual plans also go into five and 10 year plans, all documented in a system, a process, and with templates and all of those things. And as a result, I ended up early in life saying, what is it that I want to accomplish worldwide and suck the marrow out of life? And that is what we would now call a bucket list. So my bucket list is over 400 items and over 300 have checked the box and I'm in hot pursuit of the others. Yeah, you know, So one thing our listeners should know, all of your goals going back a bunch of years, you have them on your website. And I want to unpack a little bit about the goal setting process, but I want to make sure everybody knows that because I've used your templates and you're like the inspiration for many of the goals that I've set where I go and I read your year in review and your goals for the next year. And it's an incredible system. You sound like a stalker. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I mean, you put it out there, Jack, uh, and I think our listeners should follow that. One of the things I think about you is you're what I would call 
positively deviant behavior. This is what Kim Cameron at the University of Michigan would say. We study the positive outliers. Like, I'm not going to run marathons in 50 states, right? But there's a lot I can learn from your process. A lot of our listeners, we don't have to do everything you did, but there's something there. So explain to us your approach to setting goals and holding yourself accountable to their achievement. Yeah. So the first thing I would tell you is as a professional speaker, I will get in front of an audience and say, by a show of hands, how many of you would like to be more successful than you are already? And let's just say that there's 500 people in that audience. How many hands do you think are up? All 500. But then if I were to leave the stage with a mic and say to different individuals, so could you share what success means to you? It's crickets. And so the first message I give to an audience is you can't get there if you don't know what there is. Stephen Covey said it way better than me. Begin with the end in mind. Yeah. So sitting down and reflecting as an individual, what would you call a successful life? And as you said, it will differ from person to person. Incidentally, most aren't going to wake up and say success is running a marathon in all 50 states. I get that. But what is it that your component parts are? Because if we get those component parts, we then can start picking and building our plans to accomplish them. Now, in terms of the question that you raised about accountability, once I have my goals set for the next year, which is that happens by about mid-December, I then drop them onto one of two websites uh, that you can look at. They're on both, jackdailyslifebydesign.com or jackdailysales.com. And they're there for the world to see. That just added a dimension of accountability where anytime I show up somewhere, people can say, well, how are you doing on playing the top 100 golf courses? Or how are you doing on visiting all the presidential libraries? And so there's an accountability process. But let me add one more element. And the big element is, I have five people that I have designated the board of directors of my life. And I ask all five of those people, hey, four times a year, just meet with me one-on-one -on -one and check line by line as to whether I'm achieving my goals. What that translates to, Alan, is 20 times a year, somebody's holding me accountable. And that accountability process combined with in writing with specific targets my actual life ends up being a reflection or a mirror of what I really wanted it to be. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So define success for yourself, hold yourself accountable, and use some outside advisors to help you be accountable. And I love the idea of checking in with them and spreading that out over the year. I think that's a beautiful process. So I'm sitting here at my office in, at the desk, and I just want to reach over here because this is always within reach. And in here are my goals. And this goes on for three pages. But this measuring tool, every day I write down every single thing I did that relates to my goals in my personal life. And at the end of the calendar, I have my high payoff activities of what I wanted to do month by month tracking. And I can look at where I was last year for a month to month, year to year lookup. This practice, Alan, I have been doing for 60 years. It is a life by design, as you said, not by default. That's impressive. And for listeners, Jack just showed me his notebook, which has extensive notes and goals written down on it. Where do you see people falling off when they're setting goals? You know the research, as we all do, New Year's resolutions and all this type of thing. So wh where's the fall off and what advice do you have to help us cement the habits? It's a great, great question. And the answer is multiple parts. Uh, one is that board of directors of my life, those chosen people are people that care immensely about me and are willing to take me on when I'm not performing. And that component part is really significant. For example, I was married to, to Bonnie for 47 years. Now, I lost her six years ago to cancer, but we were high school sweethearts and all the way through a 52-year relationship. Well, she was always disappointed that she was never invited to be a board of director of my life. But the reason is she wouldn't hold me accountable at the level I want. 
I would say I got eight of the 10 things on my list accomplished, but these are the two I didn't. And she'd say, Jack, you get done more than anyone else I know. Lighten up on yourself. That's not what you want from an accountability partner. My five people are very, very insistent that I do what I said I was going to do. So accountability is a very, very big item. The second one is things that get measured get done. So that whole tracking process and doing it every day, if I miss a day of doing some things that I know were important to, I'm not going to get far off the bus because do you really want to write down three days in a row that you didn't do what you said you were going to do? For example, this one, my audiences laugh like crazy, but I track every day whether I floss my teeth. Now, On that calendar tracking system, do I want to have three days in a row that I didn't say I'd floss my teeth? It's such an easy thing. So all of a sudden you go, well, I didn't floss my teeth, floss my teeth yesterday. I I damn well am going to floss my teeth this day. So if there was a thread that I see through your books and your life and extraordinary achievement, you know, it would be systems and processes. Um, and, And I'll call what you just showed me. Your, I'll call that your life playbook and accountability. How many organizations have good playbooks that they actually document? Let's talk about a sales organization, but it could be any any function in the business. How many of them have a good playbook and can say, it's written, it's documented, and we follow it? Here's what I say to so many people around the world. Sports teams are run better than most businesses. And it comes down to three things. One, every coach in every sport at every level has a playbook. Exactly what you just said. The best practices, proven systems and processes. And I want to come back there. The second reason the sport teams are run better than most businesses is they practice. And I'm talking about significant practice. So the question in business is, how often are your people practicing? And then the third reason is they have an on-the-field coach. In sports, the coach is belly-to-belly, face-to-face with the players. In business, if I go back to the playbook, on average, 98 out of every 100 companies that we get in touch with do not have a sales playbook. Which translates to me that every salesperson is doing their own thing. And if you can imagine transferring that over to sports, that would be like a football team and the quarterback gets in the huddle and says, all right, uh, everybody go out and do your own thing and I'll look for an open man. It's insanity. (laughs) And you you lived this and, and developed this. At one point, how many salespeople did you manage when you stepped into a big role way back when to, to figure this out? Yeah, so the largest sale, yeah, largest sales force was 2,600 salespeople. And in that company, in over 100 locations, each time I'd visit a location, I had the same message, which was, there aren't 2,600 best ways to sell this stuff. Wouldn't it make more sense to figure out the best way, build the systems and processes, practice the systems and processes. And I bet you we just beat the pants off of anybody that we compete with. Yeah, I love it. When you think about a pro coach, a pro coach doesn't step onto the field. He doesn't play part of the game. But yet in business, I think we always see CEOs stepping in and doing sales, sales leaders doing sales. What should a business leader be doing and focused on, sales leader or business leader of any type? I've got a saying for that, and it doesn't just include your question. It includes anything in life. And the saying is, model the master's. Identify whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's personal life or business, and figure out the role models and ride shotgun with them, pick their brains, see if they have a playbook, see if you can get their playbook, all all of those types of things. So I'm a, a voracious reader. Last year, I read 104 books. Now, 
probably 90 of those 104 were business. And in that journey, I'm looking for how can I learn from the masters, the people that are writing these business books who have accomplished and built billion dollar companies. So Alan, here's what I would distill it down to. If I'm a business leader that wants to grow my business in a significant fashion, there's three things that you really need to get a grip on. One is vision. What is it that you're trying to build? Secondly, key people in key spots. And third is building a winning culture, a place where people actually want to go to work as opposed to have to go to work. So if I get those three components together and that's where I log my time as a business leader, then I have a team that can execute at that level of execution. And talk about the, in all of those, the role of the sales leader isn't to produce the sales number, although they're accountable for that, but it's really about growing sales leaders. And building on that, Dave Ulrich from the University of Michigan, and a lot of these people have been on the podcast, his recent research that that we worked on found that leaders aren't very good at recruiting and motivating and developing people that report to them. And I find that odd, right? It's in striking contrast. It's what you say is the most important and what they should be doing. And yet it's something that we find it's an area that people aren't focused on, whether they're worried about vision or strategy or managing up or managing down. They're doing all of these things, but not those things that matter. And so I'm just curious about, you know, applying that concept to broader leaders of a business. Yeah. Look, again, I'm repetitive, but things that get measured get done. How are you spending your time and what are you spending your time on? I've phrased this as high payoff activities. When I go into an organization, what I want to know about the salespeople is how do you spend your time? You know, there's an important number in life. It's called 168. And 168 is the equalizer. That is, we all, every week, have 168 hours at our disposal. That's math. 24 hours a day times seven days is 168. But then you start stripping it down. You got to sleep eight hours a day. That lose 56 there. Then you get to eat and you exercise and you're social. And all of a sudden, the 168 distills down to about 40 to 60 hours a week that you can inject into your business. Unless you're somebody like Elon Musk that somehow does three times that. But here's the thing. If I'm a salesperson, and I've got 50 hours to inject into my business life, I better be damn sure that it's on the high payoff activities of winning new customers and growing the ones they have. Now, that's an easy thing for me to say, but when we go into an organization and we actually get them to write down how they're spending their time, more than 50% of a salesperson's time is spent on things that are not high payoff activities. Now, here's the other part. I took on CEO coaching as a role in my company, and I coach CEOs all over the world virtually. And I've been doing that for six years. And what I have discovered is when I ask the CEO to go through the same process, I am appalled at the number of hours they're investing in things that are not high payoff activities as I would see the CEO role, which is vision, key people in key spots, and culture, right? And I've taught many, many business leaders this, and that is, if you don't have an assistant, you are one. There are things that need to be done in sales, but not necessarily done by the salesperson. Let's do it with the CEO. There are things that need to be done in that CEO role, but not necessarily done by you. And, uh, you know, earlier you mentioned the newspaper boy at 13 years old. Well, I took a newspaper route from 32 customers to 275. And after I go to school and do my homework, I got to deliver 275 papers. Now I don't have any time to sell and it's not a fun job. But I taught myself to hire five kids that were under 12 and have them deliver the papers. And as a result of that, I could then take on new things, which was the caddying job. So you discovered high payoff activities at 13. So what would your advice be for some early career professionals right now that that haven't even given thought to high payoff activities and maybe they're just kind of doing what they're told? How do you break out from that mold and, and start to craft that design? I, I graduated 
uh, from college as an accounting major and went to work for what was called Arthur Anderson back then. And you had to account for your time in 15 minute segments called billable hours. And if you have to track your time in 15 minute segments, and then what's billable and what's not billable, um, the rubber meets the road pretty quick when you've got a manager that's saying the majority of your time, we can't bill. And if you don't figure out how to do that, um, you're not going to be here. So it's how do I get my billable hours up, which is high payoff activities, right? So again, we're back to things that get measured, get done. So Take an individual that's early in their career and sit down and track and measure. Now, whether it's 15 minutes, I'm not wigged out on, but maybe it's I spent an hour at this, I spent a half hour at that, I spent two hours at this. And at the end of the week, just sit down in a relaxing environment and take a look at it and say, am I getting the most out of of what I could be getting out of? What is it on that list that I could remove and allow me to be more productive. Let me show it to you. I'll transition over to me as a professional speaker. When I look at how a lot of speakers are investing their time compared to me, I'm gaining on them regularly because I'm very, very focused on high payoff activities. So I typically travel 200,000 air miles a year or more. 2019, for example, right before the pandemic, I was in over 30 countries. Now, can you imagine me sitting at a keyboard booking this travel, not just air, but um, hotels and ground transportation. And then my business manager calling me and I'm in Australia and her saying, hey, do you want to add on another week and go to Kuala Lumpur and Singapore? And I go, sure, let's do that. And then sit down and have to do that with my 168 hours. Uh, that would be foolish for me. So I have an assistant that takes off of me so much of the things that I should not be doing. A high payoff activity for me, a revenue generating activity for me, is to be in front of an audience and speak. A revenue generating activity for me is creating another tool for people to improve their lives, like writing a book or doing a podcast or doing an audio recording. Um, uh, those I can't really legitimately delegate because I'm the intellectual property. But anything else that isn't a revenue generator for me, well, I could probably get that done through someone else. Think of this. Let's just go to the president of the United States and the magnitude of that job and um, how much work is the president doing in terms of the details of most anything. And imagine waking up as the president each day. I would imagine there's a calendar of every minute of the day and we're not going to have that person working on things that aren't of the highest magnitude. And so this executive office building next to the White House is filled with all of the people that I'm going to call assistants. So no matter what role you have in life, operate in a similar fashion. Again, model the masters. Model the masters. Yeah, I, well, I love the high payoff activities. And I think every one of us and every one of our listeners could benefit from just sitting down and sort of saying, how do I spend my 40 or 50 hours in a week? So last night I was on a bike ride with a group of guys and just utterly getting punished. And there's a Yale professor, Paul Bloom, that studies happiness, and he's come up with the concept of pleasurable suffering. An odd combination, but pleasurable su suffering. And he says something effortless and risk-free isn't likely to be a meaningful pursuit. So, uh, you know, you're the exemplar here. But pleasurable suffering, his examples are like having a baby, running a marathon, watching a scary movie. I want to know, how do you endure the suffering of running a marathon in Antarctica? I didn't start out as a marathon runner. Someone came into my office and said, there's a 5K run on Saturday for the Heart Fund. And if you signed up as the leader of the company, we could probably get a lot of other people to sign up and raise some money. And so I said, that would be great. And I had not run a mile up till then. And Saturday, I ride in this 5K and I thought I was going to literally die. But at the end of it, I was so filled with joy. 
and I sold so many other people with a similar feeling of accomplishment. So I became a 5K fanatic. Every weekend I'm running a 5K. And one weekend I couldn't find one. And in my windshield wiper at the end of the race, there was a race next week for a 10K. So I ran the 10K and I became a 10K junkie. Then I did a 10 miler. Then I said, well, 13.1 is a half marathon. I should do a half marathon. So I finished the half marathon and I'm celebrating with my wife, Bonnie. I have this beautiful meal, this beautiful bottle of wine, my medal. And I asked Bonnie, hey, take my photo, would you? And as she's setting up to take my photo, I uncontrollably cannot stop laughing. And she said, Jack, the photo's not going to come out well if you're laughing like you're laughing. What the hell are you laughing about? And I said, I'm trying to think of any time in my life that I celebrated doing half of something. <laughs> and she then said, oh, my God, you're going to do a full marathon. And I said, yeah. So I finished the full marathon. And at the end, I, I said, well... If I could go under four hours, that'll satisfy me. Well, I didn't make it on my first try. So I signed up for another one three months later and went sub four. And I thought about it. Now I have two marathons finished. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I think if I did one marathon a year, it will help me stay in physical shape. So I did 10 marathons, one in one state and nine in another state. And you know that I've done 50 in 50 states and 100 overall and one in all the continents, including, as you said, Antarctica. Well, how did that all happen? And so what happened is my fourth L.A. marathon was my 10th. And a guy ran by me with a T-shirt that on the back it said, I ran a marathon in all 50 states. So I caught back up with him and said, what's up with that? And he said, there's a, a website, and there's a club. So I joined the club. And then when I started running the other marathons in the other states, I'd start to see the same people trying to do the 50 states. And then guys were going, are you doing the seven continents? And I'm going, there's a, such a thing. And I'm like, well, that goes on my bucket list. So on the bucket list, it went. Pete Carroll said this better than me. Model the masters, because I think he's a master at what he does. And he said that the day that you play the game each week, let's say they're played on Sunday, the majority of NFL games, that Sunday is a moment of celebration for the players. The whole six days prior, he beats his guys up in practice like nobody's business. And there's no one in the stands. And there's, I mean, it's just brutal, brutal, brutal. Well, I'm going to tell you that no matter how cold it's uh, in Antarctica, no matter how sloppy the conditions, no matter how stark and empty it is, because if you're looking for people cheering you, they're going to be penguins and not people. And yet the feeling of accomplishment is so immense that it overshadows the work that went in to prepare you for it. So I think about that saying that we all have heard, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Whatever the enormity of the task is, if that prize is something that you genuinely uh, want to get, then break it down into its component parts. Let, let's go back to my business as a professional speaker. The majority of speakers recognize how better it would be for them if they had a book. But they'll confide in me and say, I just can't find a time to write the book. Well, if I take hyper sales growth, the book is about 200 pages. It's about 15 chapters, which means that a chapter is about 15 pages long. And what if I set a goal to write one chapter a week for 15 weeks? Well, in four months, I would have the first guts of the book finished and probably have it published before the end of the 12th month. But all I have to do is be disciplined to say, can you squeeze 15 pages out of you this week? and just be disciplined about doing that. We're disciplined about flossing our teeth. Well, I am, I track it. And so that's how you get there. So Jack, wh what do you say to people that want to get rich quick or they read life hacks or all these YouTube videos and things, They er, everything is about the shortcut, the hack, the whatever. I don't hear you saying anything that sounds like that. What do you think when you see all that stuff? The first thing that I can tell you, Alan, is that if you're not happy, if you're not passionate about what it is that you're 
involved in, there's not going to be any success, even if you were to put a bunch of money in the bank. But if you really have this ambition to kind of build some monetary aspects, if that's really something that you want to achieve, the first order of business is you've got to be passionate about it. The second order of business is forget about the money. That's sort of the Walsh thing about the scoreboard will take care of itself. That, that'll all be, take care of itself as long as you have uh, something that you're contributing to society that has worth that has value, and then the rest will take care of itself. So I don't want to sit down and take a year of my life to write a book so that I can make a million dollars when the book comes out. I would like to write the book such that people came back to me and said, it really enhanced my life in some dimension, and uh, I'm recommending it to a whole heck of a lot of other people, and, and, and let's just model the master. The richest person in the world, unless he's been dethroned, is Elon Musk, but here's a guy that is not getting up in the morning trying to figure out how to make money. This is a guy that he very much believes that we humans are going to need another planet other than Earth to continue our species. That's why he's in the rocket business. And he is generally focused on that vision, not how can I make more money? And the money takes care of itself. Yep. Yep. And I asked the question really facetiously because I'm a big believer and a huge fan of Life by Design, right? It's impacted me, a lot of your books and leadership, and I follow it. And I, having started and built and sold three companies in education technology, I've never found any secret that's fast or shortcut or hack in my lifetime. So I think uh, what you've done, you are the master that I want to model. And I would recommend to all of our listeners to take a look at your work, particularly Life by Design, because it speaks to everyone. I mean, there's nobody that can't live a better life by following some of the principles in that book. You don't have to take all of them, but pick something and go and run with it. And I promise you, your life would get better. Jack, as we wrap up here, we have a question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what are you curious about and learning now? And it could be personally, professionally. Um, you know, since I wrote the book, Alan, and I've gotten several emails from people under 20, the thing that I'm curious about is how could I enter that market? Can I do it with the book that I wrote or do I need to step up and write a book that's called Jack Daly's Life by Design for Young Adults? Because quite frankly, I don't think that they're getting the direction that's in that book by going to school today. And I don't care what school they're going to. I think my book for kids would be the equivalent of me interviewing those golfers back when I was 13. Yeah, I love it. Taking the life by design principles and translating them for young adults, I think I can't imagine anything more sorely needed than that right now. Thank you. Jack. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. You know what? It, it, look, I've done several, and I don't say this gratuitously. I say it sincerely. The preparation that you've invested translated into, I think, us delivering a good product here today. Unfortunately, the majority of people don't make the sacrifices and show up and, quote unquote, don't finish the race. You, my friend, have finished the race. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot. Thanks again to Jack Daly for joining us on the podcast. Follow Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business, wherever you find your podcasts. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode to help you level up your leadership skills. Follow the show so you never miss a new episode. And if you like the show, leave a rating or a review. We love the feedback and it really helps us to find new listeners. To learn more about Leading Up or how Udemy can help you develop leaders at scale and move business forward, visit business.udemy.com. The Leading Up podcast is produced by Udemy in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Alex McManus, Amy Machado, Brian Rivers, Michelle O'Brien, and Carter Wogan. Our original theme is by Soundboard.